Good morning. <laughs> Today is Monday the 5th of February and we've got another spell of cold weather on the way. So what I've decided to do is cram a few um, videos in because look it means I don't have to wear extra layers because it's about 11 degrees I've got a couple of windows open in the flat just airing it but in a couple of days that temperature's really going to drop and I think we're going to have some snow so I thought I would cram some just stuff in basically and I wanted to start with something that I found last week so I get a lot of questions on are they questions? I think some of them are questions on <clears throat> excuse me some of them are questions on YouTube some of them are just blanket scathing comments about people on benefits and um, some of them are just people clearly just a bit angry and want a bit of attention so I was looking, I was trying to answer a particular question and I was using Google to try and find some information about the history of universal credit and in particular information about the migration from working tax credits um, to universal credit and I've included a little bit of that on um, another video which has already come out I think I posted it on one called January was angry which Kate which is coming out this evening actually the fifth and it's really interesting looking at um, the people who are working tax credits so the working tax credits that there was a working tax element there's the child tax element and working tax credits was a really simple easy system so I have been on it since 2017 and you can only get it in certain circumstances. You have to be working over so many hours. You have to have an income. I think it's above a certain amount. You can't have anyone else in your house who is earning enough and effectively could pay your bills for you. So when I was on it, I couldn't have it until I was basically living on my own. Um, so I've had it, I had it for a, a few years before I then transitioned onto universal credit using the managed migration. And if you're on working tax credits or you have been on working tax credits, you may well have been offered that possible transition. They would assess your claim and decide if you then got universal credit. But there's a whole backstory to universal credit and I'm, I'm really into statistics now the document I'm going to show you is probably biased and if you have other information not your personal opinion if you have other um, websites that have other statistics on it please let me know because I'm always interested in the other side of the argument but I've included this because it has lots of graphs and lots of graphics and lots of information and I do like that. I'm a bit of a nerd for statistics, spreadsheets and numbers, although I would never say that I'm particularly good at maths. So what you have here is the government website. It's the Department for Work and Pensions website. And as you can see, these are the official statistics for universal credit from 29th of April 2013 to the 13th of July 2030, 2023, sorry. So what you've got is a 10 year history of the universal credit system. Um, I didn't actually know universal credit had been going that long, but hey ho. So this is quite a long document, but I, and I kind of skim read some of it and I looked into detail at some of it, but I just thought it was really interesting and I thought I would show you some of the graphs and some of the information that's on it and I will add a link to this particular website in the the notes for this vlog so that you can go along and have a look yourself um, so it starts off with a statistic about the numbers of people on um, universal credit so 
as of July 2023, which of course is the middle of last year, 6.1 million people were on universal credit. And people go, oh, that's 6.1 million scroungers, blah, 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 blah. But universal credit covers an awful lot of things. It covers people who are just not working at all. It covers people who have work but don't earn enough. So people on low incomes, people on part-time work. It covers people who um, have caring responsibilities, who have uh, various kinds of disabilities which prevents them from work. It covers people who are looking after children as well as maybe elderly parents or etc. etc. It covers people who are preparing to go back to work. So it may be that their, their child is about to start school and they can effectively look for work within school hours. And it may also cover people who are on the verge of starting work. You know, they found the job or the child is like starting school now. So there's all different aspects of what universal credit covers and how it helps people, allegedly. And some of these statistics are quite interesting. So there's a statistic here that says that there were on average 43 thousand claims for universal credit per week in July 2023. That is an enormous number of people. And of those 43,000, 34,000 claims were started. And it also says underneath, half of the households on universal credit um, with a payment had children in May 2023. So it goes to show that if you're a parent, you're going to be struggling on less, pretty much. And, of course, these children will be of various ages. And I think children are up to the age of 18. So you could be claiming for children that are on the verge of leaving school when they officially become adults and you will lose your... I presume it's the, the child tax element of universal credit, but I don't have any of that, so you'll have to put me straight on that. So here is um, some of what is involved in universal credit and what the statistics cover. So number of claims, um, number of people who verified their identity and accepted their claim and commitment. So you have to sign an agreement that when you start universal credit that will you will do X, Y, Z, to either find work or increase your income, um, la di da di da. Um, number of people who started on universal credit with no end date recorded, so they're still ongoing claims, and the number who um, have a calculated entitlement. There's some information on here that I'm not too worried about. Um, and of course, it says underneath that the pandemic impacted these statistics. And what I kind of noticed from some of the graphs that you're going to see is that the effects, the ripple effects of the pandemic are still very much here. So there was a knee-jerk reaction. You had the lockdowns, which obviously had a huge effect. You have staff put on furlough. Um, after that, you have businesses that have closed down, businesses that hung on for a while and then closed down, businesses that had to get rid of staff, so more people needing um, help less jobs around because so many um, so many businesses have shut down so many big chains have shut down and <clears throat> even now businesses that had limped through the pandemic and the last couple of years are now closing down and people are now losing their jobs because we have now have a cost of living crisis which has come afterwards and that is still having a massive knock-on impact so here is our first little graph that says there were 6.1 million people on universal credit in July 2023. And this graph shows you what happened between July 2018, which was like two or three months after I moved into my flat here, and up to the middle of last year. <clears throat> and you can see where that dotted line is, where the pandemic hit in March when the lockdown started and you can see the huge number of claims from people who lost their jobs who were furloughed 
um, people who got COVID and were sick and are long-term sick because long COVID is very much still around. Um, and I think there are probably other knock-on effects of household breaking down, job losses, all sorts of things. There are just so many elements to it. So this graph is really telling because those figures haven't really changed that much between March 2020 and July 2023. So some of this I would imagine is to do with the closing of the legacy benefits which has been a bit of a stuttered start because they I think they had started it pre-pandemic they froze the transition the migrations because of the pandemic and then they restarted it again I think it was at some point in was it late 2022 or early 2023 and I had my migration notice in I think it was June 2023 and I started Universal Credit in the September so that's an interesting graph on its own which shows that the impact of the pandemic kind of started to go away. You see this dip here, which, and then it starts to rise again, which I'm going to guess is when the cost of living crisis really started to kick in. This area here is where energy prices started to really rise, um, where fuel prices started to rise, and we've had the continuous rise in food prices since then. Although, these prices are still rising even now, but they are far more incremental than they were. Um, and it shows here, it says here underneath, that the number of people on Universal Credit has been increasing since March 2022. It was 5.5 million then, and now it's over 6 million. But the previous peak was in March 2021, which doesn't surprise me because that's still pandemic times. Um... And it says the number of people on universal credit in the no work requirements conditionality continues to rise. Um, further down on this document, there is a clarification of what all the categories are for people. So I will go into that further on. The no work requirements condition, I think, is people who don't need to fulfill any requirements for the universal credits for various reasons I assume. So these are all the conditionality regimes. So you have people of no work requirements and again I will go into that later. Some of them are more self-explanatory so 1.4 million people here searching for work so those are people who probably lost their jobs, were furloughed, the businesses they work for shut down you know, you've got everyone from small businesses up to Wilco. We have the work no requirements, a working no requirements section. And I think that is people who are who have open universal credit claims. They are earning enough so then so they're not getting or they're at least they're not getting anything from the universal credit, but their work situation may be a bit fuzzy so they might suddenly need a boost in income because maybe their work is seasonal etc etc working with requirements those are people like me so you've got people on lower incomes who are looking for either new work or more work or trying to increase the money they get from the businesses that maybe they run or however else they're making their money so me having a small business but having a bunch of um side hustles which are topping it up to um, up hopefully to a livable wage and you've also got I think you also need to take into account here that there's a mixture of people who are who have been accepted onto the universal credit system as it is and also people who've accepted for the um, the transitional protection so people like me who get the protected year and what that kind of means is that if you are self-employed and you've you've been on working tax credits and you transition with, with the protected year from working tax credits to universal credit they are 
what, what, what they're doing is they're treating you as a startup business for one year. So they're giving you a year to prove that your business um, is making enough money and is worth you carrying on with. And it's because the system has changed, because working tax credits is so different to universal credit. credit. So they're giving you the benefit of the doubt. So you get this protected year, which um, takes out various things. So if they've decided that your business looks like it will be viable and you're worth supporting for a year whilst you increase that, they're helping you. They will also disregard a certain number of savings um, if that helps them in encourage your business to improve. So they're hoping that you've got that tr transitional year, you may not have got universal credit anyway, but they're helping you because they, they're helping to almost prop you up for a year and after that year you go it alone and you have a business that will work or you have a business that kind of works but you have other work as well so it might be you have a small PAYE job it might be like me you have a bunch of side hustles um, because at the end of the day when you're doing your self-assessment everything goes into the same pot it doesn't matter where the money comes from as long as you're paying um, you're earning enough it doesn't really matter and then at the bottom of this this graph you have the last two categories which are preparing for work so people who are about to start a new job etc etc and then you have the planning for work which are people who are in the middle of job searches and things like that I think so that's my interpretation of those categories which again I will show you later in more detail and it says here uh, underneath that as, as people move across from legacy benefits, the composition of people on universal credit continues to change because people on the, on the working tax credit and the child tax credit elements have come at it from different places. Um, so it says, at first, universal credit was only available to working age individuals with no children who were seeking employment. So it's a very straightforward, almost like a job seekers allowance type affair. Over time, that has now been opened up to people in various circumstances who either can work, can't work. They're migrating some of the, uh, as far as I understand, some of the disability elements. So people who are on the old disability elements of the benefit system are being pushed over onto universal credit as well. And that is causing an awful lot of problems because um, the DWP deems you to be um, able to work and a lot of people with disabilities of various kinds of mental health issues may not be. But if the DWT decides that you can work, you could work. If you could find an employer who is willing to take you, you could work. So that's kind of how that works, which is causing all sorts of trouble. And of course, it encompasses people who are migrating over from legacy benefits, people like me who probably wouldn't normally get universal credit, but because we are on that protected startup year and getting a bit of a, a boost up the ladder to help us on our way and hopefully then get rid of us on, off the system, which is very likely for many of the, um, the protected migration um, people who after that year, one year, just won't be eligible. Um, it says the number of people on universal credit in the searching for work conditionality has fallen from its peak, which means that there are more people in work rather than searching for work, but doesn't necessarily mean they are earning enough. So they may have moved into another section where they are in work, but having their money supplemented and because universal credit works on a monthly basis they might get they might get 20 quid one month they might be 20 quid short on their their income floor they might be 300 short another month because things change particularly if you are um, maybe a part-time worker or you work for someone where your shifts change depending on the availability of work all sorts of things like that um, but it does say that the number of people on universal credit in the no work requirements conditionality has been rising steadily. Um, as it, and it says about how this is because of the new claims coming through and as people migrate from ESA as well. Um, employment and support allowance I think is connected to the, the dis various disability payments. 
um, so it's all a bit fuzzy. A, it's a bit fuzzy for me because I don't have any experience of those sections of the system, and B, it's fuzzy because the DWP has very different ideas of who can work compared to people who are effectively the victims of the system. Um, and here's some other statistics. So 57% of people on universal credit were women. That may be because of childcare or other caring responsibilities. And there's some more interesting graphs here. So men and women um, in the various sections and if you like to label people and you like to divide people up and you like the statistics of, you know, gender and situations, etc., you will find that quite interesting. Um, here's the average median of age of people who are claiming. Um, median ages of claimants are 37 and 38. And it doesn't seem to, to change much between July 2022 and July 2023. So that's that one. And you, again, I will, I will post a link to this, this website in the notes so you can go and have a look at these charts in a bit more detail. 38% um, of people on universal credit were in employment in June 2023. So you're going to have a range of things here. You're going to have people who, like me, are self-employed and their income varies greatly. You will have people who are in work but are probably on in jobs where they're not being paid properly or not getting enough hours. So you're, you're, you may well have your, your gig workers, your delivery drivers, your part-time workers um, who may be looking for other work but... It may be that they have caring responsibilities and they're slotting a job in in between those responsibilities. So there's a whole range of, of people in that respect. So it says here, universal credit is available to people on a low income as well as those who are out of work. Uh, these statistics define an, de uh, define an individual as in employment if they receive employee earnings for the assessment period um, and it's about when the numbers get included. So here is a graph of the number of people on universal credit but in employment. And this graph dates from June 2018, which means that the number of people who have been in work but also receiving top-ups against their income because they don't earn enough has been going on for longer than the pandemic and the cost of living crisis, which kind of shows that nothing is changing really. Although you have those peaks in those earlier graphs, which are a reaction to the pandemic and the cost of living crisis, those numbers also change because you've got people there that um, maybe were out of work for a bit and then found another job or have moved on to a different category. These are the number of people who are in work but receiving extra help because their jobs don't meet um, their living standards and it's a huge variety of people and you all and don't forget you've also got the minimum wage the minimum wage even if you are working that in a 40 or 50 hour job and depending on where you live and your circumstances will probably not cover your living expenses because the uh, the minimum wage at the moment is less than 11 pounds an hour now that changes on the 1st of April but it's not going up a lot I think it's something at 9.8%. So you're only getting pence in the pound. And it's still not going to be enough. But, you know, many people will say, well, that's the point. The, the Tory government wants to keep the poor poor, keeps them in place, keeps them in check, keeps them at the bottom rung of the ladder so they're unable to improve themselves. And that's how you keep everyone, um, everyone in check and following the rules. I'm not going to get into the politics of it. I probably will end up doing that because universal credit is a very political argument. But I don't see many changes. And I don't think that the minimum wage has risen for a while. And this change that's coming in April isn't going to make a massive difference. So it says, 
as of June 2023, 2.3 million people were on, un on universal credit were in employment, but getting extra top-ups because their jobs don't pay enough for them to live on. And that 2.3 million accounts for 38% of everyone on universal credit. So the argument that everyone on universal credit is a scrounger, you know, go out and get a better job, you're, you're, you're kind of accusing 38% of the claimants because the other claimants are in different situations and it says underneath that any increase in the employment rate during COVID should not be interpreted as more employment um, because there were people moving over from different uh, different benefits and there were temporary situations and it's quite an artificial way to measure um, employment statistics when you have something like a pandemic and now with a cost of living crisis because those are not normal environments. Um, so here is a percentage graph of the people on universal credit in employment by their conditionality regime. So you've got uh, what looks like 19% are searching for work so they're in the process of looking for work and universal credit is supporting them while they do that. You've got working with requirements, so you've got people who are in work, who need to be finding more work, or are trying to improve their businesses because they're in that that um, um, that associated um, start-up year from the predicted tra the protected transition. You've got a no requirements, a no work requirements section, which we'll go into. As, um, as th th those will be people who can't work. So you've got a section. It'll be disability. There is a section that describes people as basically having no hope of finding work. <laughs> it's not quite worded like that, but I'll show you that in a bit. So this will be people who cannot work or have no, or I think actually people of state pension age also count within that because I think some of them get top up elements if they're on state pension um, or they have lower state pension because they didn't have their full number of years to top up their state pension to the full allowance. You've got working and no requirements, so these are people who have open claims but are working and earning enough so that they don't get universal credit, so they're meeting the minimum income floor, I presume. Then you have the planning for work people who are on the verge of being able to go back to work, maybe they've had children or whatever, and there's a preparing for work, so they're in those, those last stages. So that's an interesting graph as well. Um, and then it talks about how those figures are reached. Um, different aspects of someone's work-related circumstances. So we have your, yeah, 19% of claimants in searching for work had earnings and were record, recorded as in employment because people with low earnings can be placed in the having work section. And I think this is one of the reasons that, so when I started my business back in 2012, there was a big push for people to start their own businesses. Because once you are classed as self-employed, it doesn't matter how much you earn, you are classed as being in work. So you can be self-employed, you could be running like a little back bedroom business, like pretty much what I do. And you can also be earning nothing at all from that but because you are self-employed you are classed as being in work so the government loved that because it kept you off the unemployment figures it didn't matter that you were probably starving to death in your back room whilst you tried to try to run this business you were still classed as being in work so that kept you off the unemployment figures so this is where this comes into play so you've got um, people who don't earn enough and need help but being in the work, in work category, which keeps them off the un unemployment figures. And that's great for government numbers because they're all about, uh, you know, oh look, our unemployment, our unemployment rates went down, which basically means that there were less people classed as unemployed, but it didn't mean they were earning enough. And all that matters at the end of the day is those numbers. They don't care how people are living, what they're interested in is which category do you fall into? Um, and here we have uh, to compare 70% of people placed in the working and no requirements conditionality who are not employed. So um, 
yeah, so they're not employed, usually due to earnings from the other adult in the home. Because if you live in a house with, maybe your income's really low, but your partner works, or you have adult children working, um, you won't be counted as universal credit claimant, I don't think, because other people will be expected to pay for your shortfall. So again, that doesn't mean you're earning enough to contribute to the household, it just means you ain't getting nothing. So here we are, the, the proportion of people in employment in each conditionality regime has been consistent despite the distribution of people. So you've got the same number of people, but they're just moving between different um, the different categories, the different conditionalities. Uh, right, so let's go down to claims and starts. So an average of 43,000 claims per week in July last year alone. That is an enormous number of people. A lot of this will be cost of living crisis. A lot of this will still be the fallout from the pandemic. Businesses that have probably limped on and now the cost of living crisis has finally done them in. So they've had to, had to close down and shed all their staff. 34,000 of those 43,000 claimants were accepted or started on universal credit. So that means that there are thousands of people whose claims were unsuccessful and who knows what they're doing. And there you see the weekly rates, you see how it goes up and down. It, massive dips in January, um, presumably something to do with Christmas. Dips in January 22, which I think is probably when things were recovering from the pandemic. And then, hey look, cost of living crisis, here we come. And then you can see that rising and April 2023, Man, that got bad there. So that's another interesting little graph for you to look at. Households on universal credit. A household is a single person or cohabiting couple with or without dependent children. So pretty much everyone. Uh, right, what do we have here? 5.1 million households on universal credit in May 2023. Um, so here's, this relates to uh, presumably, oh right, yes, so from April 2020, increase in households with no payment indicator due to the change to keep zero awards open. So these may be people that have open claims, but they're not actually claiming any money. Um, or may not be eligible. I don't know whether furlough has anything to do with that. Um, who knows? I don't entirely understand this particular graph. I'm sure someone else will. It's not terribly relevant to me um, because I was still on working tax credits at this point. Um, the number of households on universal credit, 5.1 million in May 2023, larger than its previous peak, which is February 2021, which was probably as businesses were coming out of lockdowns and realising they were going to have to shut down. So you've got a lot more people, a lot more businesses shedding staff closing down branches, big chains that had thinned out the number of branches they had, like Wilco's, uh, like all these other, you know, huge, like Debenhams shut down, and big companies that you never thought would shut down, that you thought were invincible, who were just, just closing down. Half the households on universal credit, with a payment, had children. And that just goes to show that we don't really value the role of parents bringing up children. What they want is parents sticking their kids into childcare and going out to work. And childcare is hugely expensive. I've got the gist of that, even though I don't have children. But look at the different kinds of claimants. You've got couples with no children. So you've got two, two income households um, who are getting by. Couples with children. Uh, but probably both working. Slightly higher rate of claim. It may be that this is the um, child tax element. I'm not entirely sure. Single and with children. Huge. If you've got, if you've got a one parent, one income household and you've got children, juggling, looking after your children with working when childcare is so expensive must be an absolute nightmare. I don't I don't envy anybody who has to deal with that situation. It must be horrific. And then the biggest category of people on universal credit are those who are single with no children. Now, single people with no children covers a whole range of 
living situations. You might be living on your own like I do, in which case you're paying for everything yourself. You might be um, living in um, a house share or as a lodger, but you will still, you know, still be having to cover all your living expenses under one income and your one income may well not be sufficient. Here's the start of the lockdown here. Now changes of methodology, I think this is to do with different recording mechanisms. They've started to tran transition people from the old legacy benefits to working um, to universal credit, sorry. So that um, that goes up and that changes just the way the figures look but you can see here look um, look at the impact the pandemic had on people that were suddenly out of work I mean that's massive particularly that's a huge jump for single people although it's dropped down again it is net all these numbers are starting to rise the only one that has no rise on it at the looks of it are couples with no children because Two income household with limited expenses and you can cut back on some of your expenses as well you don't have to keep shelling out for expensive stuff although rents and mortgages have gone through the roof so you know I guess that probably accounts for a lot of these rises as well where people have lost their homes as well um, now it says here for those receiving a payment the average universal credit amount was 890 pounds as of May 2023 and there are people sometimes in the comments that say blimey you get so much money from universal credit I did a video that was based on the first time I received a payment from them now that was my second month with universal credit my first month I didn't get anything because I had earned enough because I had done one of those medical trials and they pay lump sum in one go so I was way over the average the next month which was the October 2023 this was while I was trying to develop my side hustles so that huge amount that I had was artificial and then it dropped back down to normal now in the October I had just started with the cleaning agency I was trying to increase my side hustles and work out what I could do and that's why my first payment on universal credit looks high but I do I think it was just short of 600 pounds I do not normally get that amount of money when you average out the number of months that I've been claiming on universal credit and how much money I've had in total from Universal Credit, my average amount comes to about 370. But because I'm self-employed, it goes up and down. So there might be a month where that first month I got some money was uh, over 500 pounds. I've had months where I've had less than 300. So it really goes up and down. And I also owed money back to working tax credits because of the way they calculate across a year when they ended my claim and migrated me to universal credit. I owed the working tax credit um, back. So they were taking um, a couple of hundred, uh, I think it was about, I think the total was £108 they took back off me. So I had months where I was earning less anyway. Fair enough, if I owed it, I owed it. So there are standard allowances. Now, with... The, the protected year, the minimum income floor, which I think is £1,403, doesn't count for you in that start-up year. So they will pay me the difference between what I earn and the minimum income floor for a year. Um, and the aim, of course, is to hit that minimum income floor so that once you get to the end of that start-up year, you're earning enough to not be on universal credit. Um, and it's difficult for me to assess what the normal universal credit system looks like because I'm not on it. I have this protected year. I have, um, I, I have different allowances for savings because it's a protected year. I have different allowances for what I have to earn because I'm on a protected year, because I'm classed as like a startup business. So these averages will be for people who probably aren't working at all. Um, 
or people with children. So this average, um, it says the amount of universal credit the household is entitled to is based on the standard allowance. I think the standard allowance is £398. And additional entitlements such as housing or childcare. So if you have children, you'll get the child tax element of it. And housing, I don't quite understand how the housing thing works. You will get a housing allowance based on your authority. Uh, so they'll look at the amount of rent you pay and then the housing authority will say, well, we can't pay all that. We don't allow that. So you'll get a lower amount. But if, like me, you have um, savings where you're having X amount of money deducted off your universal credit, you're probably not getting enough to pay the shortfall in your income or pay your rent, which is why my um, entitlement averages at £370 because they're taking off a lot of money for my savings allowance. So they give it to you then they take it away again. It's as simple as that. Um, now I think that universal credit will go up in April along with minimum inc uh, the minimum wage but it's not, I, I, think, I don't think it's rising in line with inflation. So it, it's still not going to be enough no matter what happens. And I think they've had a freeze on these, these rises for quite a while. So here we have um, increases in average payments in April, which makes sense because everyone was in lockdown. So that's a, a kind of an artificial increase. There's also a temporary increase in the standard allowance um, because lockdowns everyone was locked away there were furloughs a lot of people weren't eligible for furlough they had nothing coming in so households on universal credit with a payment average mean payment by family type so uh, increases in standard allowance there because of the lockdowns temporary increases dropped in October 2021 and then we're back on the rise now because of the cost of living crisis so another interesting graph for you there households on universal credit with a payment additional entitlements by family type so here are the different types of claims so interestingly the the, the biggest claim for house the housing section of universal credit is with the couples with children small amounts for child care we have disabled children carers here limited capability for work so um, all sorts of different elements involved in that couples with no children um, quite high and this is based on the numbers of people who are getting it not across the population as a general so again, the rent is the highest issue. Single with no children, housing is the biggest problem. Look at this. This is absolutely massive. Insane. And then your single no children, again, a bigger proportion requiring housing because of course the rent has gone through the roof in the last year or so. Um, average mean payments to households on universal credit varies by family type. For May 2023, single people with no children had the lowest average payment amount of 630, which still seems like quite a lot to me, whilst the highest average payment was £1,140 for couples with children, because I guess there were children, uh, child tax elements, child care elements as well. I'm assuming this is across the country, so these numbers will be bucked by London and the South East where it's the most expensive place to live and probably lowered by places like where I live in, in the North where you know rent is a bit cheaper, things are generally a bit cheaper. Um, so here we are, households on universal credit can be entitled to a range of additional entitlements on top of the standard allowance um, to support, support costs for children, childcare, housing, health and disabilities because they've been amalgamating uh, disability um, claims onto the universal credit system. So you could be entitled to a whole bunch of these and you can see from that there those are the different elements that you might get. And it says that nearly all households received some or all of their payment on time. Now I've had all my payments on time. Um, 
I don't know what the statistic is for that, and I don't know how accurate this is. Um, April 2023, 95% received all their payments on time. I can't comment on that. I've always had my payments on time, but I don't have a complicated claim process. Um, and again, here we have um, payments turning up on time, payments not turning up on time. And I guess if you're waiting for that payment to come through and you're desperate for that influx of cash to pay rent or bills or feed your children and it doesn't come in on time, that's probably pretty catastrophic. So that small number of people um, who got their payments on time some of the time or maybe very rarely got them on time, it, that can be catastrophic for your housing situation. Um, so yeah, some more information regarding that. Related statistics, and it'll give you information. You can click on any of these, and it'll give you further information on um, different aspects of the universal credit system. I'm not going to go into all these because I've already recorded quite a long session here. <laughs> You're going to get bored if I carry on too much longer. So about statistics, and you can go in, you can read some information on that, um, a definition of what universal credit is, and then right at the bottom you will have the conditionality regimes, which describes what group people fall into. So we have the searching for work conditionality, which includes people who are not working and looking for work, or people who have very low earnings and are looking for more work. Um, claimants are required to take action to secure work, and which is why you have meetings where you have to show what you're doing. You'll have online work journals. You'll have things that you have to meet. And when you signed up for Universal Credit, when you were taken on, you had to sign an agreement to abide by the rules on trying to find work. Um, to find work or find better work or more work or whatever it takes to get you to that minimum income floor. Um, so you have your work coach and I meet mine every, I think it's three months, um, which supports you, looks, looks at what you've entered online, looks at the claims you've made, looks at what you've been doing to improve your income, etc, etc. And you work towards hitting that minimum income floor of £1,403. It's a bit of a weird one, and particularly when you're self-employed, because they've created this minimum income floor, which is, um, this is what they think you need to survive on. Now, that's artificially high for me, because I know by doing my spreadsheets, so for last year, I know that I need to earn a minimum of £1,027 to pay for all my bills. That means I break even. It doesn't give me a profit margin, it doesn't allow me to put money into savings, but if I earn £1,027 every month across the year, say when you add up my entire year and then you divide it by 12, that would mean that I have paid all my bills, not gone into debt, not had to, you know, have my energy cut off, that sort of thing. So it's weird that you're asked to hit a minimum income floor which you don't need. And that's a problem across the universal credit system. I would say that they need that those minimum income floors need to be adjusted so that it covers your own circumstances. So it may be in London that your minimum income floor needs to be 1700 a year because rent is now so high in London or travel costs are so high. It might be like me if you lead quite a frugal life and you're very careful with your bills, that you only need to make just over a thousand pounds a month. Blanketing everybody with this 1,403 pounds a month limit that you must hit, even if you don't need to, kind of messes up the system. Universal credit is already a very complicated system and I'm guessing they didn't want to add to that. But and, and when also, I also noticed that when I joined Universal Credit, they will ask you for things like how much is your rent, but they're not interested in how much your other bills are. So they actually don't know what you need every month to survive. So they're asking me to earn a minimum of £300 more a month than I need. And because I run all, <clears throat> because I run all my spreadsheets, 
very closely and because I am self-employed and I have the calendar year which is January to December I also have my self-assessment which is the tax year so that's April to April I can see between those two years and all my spreadsheets I know what I need to earn and I do my predictions at the beginning of the year based on last year how much things cost so like my car insurance my water my electricity my gas and then I adjust those as I go so that I can see if like my car insurance was way higher this year than it was last year I've had to find an extra 70 pounds but then something else might go down so my business related expenses might be really low this year compared to last year because I've chosen to work in a different way it may be that if I'm not making as many things for my business because I already have enough stock which I do I have multiple rails of stuff which is that I have th like three big rails like this which are full of stock I have boxes of other stock that I've made I have lots in my shop I probably won't need to make anything this year so instead I'm focusing on other side hustles where I can increase my income and they don't come with any business expenses so it might be that the 800 or so pounds that I spent last year on um, my business expenses in total may only be 400 this year because it'll be my website, my Etsy fees, um, a, a few bits of, of, of um, you know, might be, I needed some more threads, I bought a couple of fabrics or something. So that element of my outgoings may drop by £400. So where I've paid £70 more for car insurance gets swallowed up by that. So the self-employed aspect of universal credit and not needing to hit an income floor that they perceive I need even though they have no idea what my expenses are every month kind of makes the system a bit weird because it means that I am never going to really hit that minimum income floor because A, I don't need it um, whereas if they dropped it to the level that I know I need I could be hitting that minimum income floor on a fairly consistent basis or it might be one month I hit it and plus more because I did a medical trial and got paid £3,000 for 10 days work which is what happened last year but also there will be months when it's lower but with self-assessment you add up everything over the course of 12 months you don't look at months in isolation it doesn't work like that because cash flow is different when you're self-employed so anyway that's the searching for work category so I, 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 I digressed a little bit on that. We'll go back to there. So yeah, the work coach supports you. And I've discussed with them about the self-employed aspects of it. And they're like, well, you just have to hit this every month. Or not quite every month for the first year. If I got to the end of my year and they decided to keep me on universal credit, I would have to be hitting that minimum income floor. But they'll be throwing me off the system when I get to the end of my year because of my savings level. I just won't be eligible. Um, typical examples of people in the searching for work category include job seekers and the self-employed in their startup period. So people like me who are being classed as a startup business because it's our first year on universal credit. So we're classed as being a new business, we're trying to improve our business, um, imagining that we are in our first year of business. And considering it can take three or four years for a business a new business to go into profit that's the kind of statistics you're looking at these days um, the startup year just you've got no chance of earning enough if you were actually a startup business and it may be that some of the claimants are startup businesses if you've joined universal credit as a new claimant and you decided right I'm going to start a business whilst also looking for other work you may well be an actual startup so working with requirements are people in work um, so it's weird because I kind of go across several, um, I think I come across two elements. So searching for work, I am searching for work, but I also am in work. So I'm kind of on both sides of it. So the working with requirements, in work but could earn more, so that probably, that's where I am, or not working but has a partner with low earnings. So you have a partner who's paying some bills but you're not earning enough so you're getting like a top up and there's another two columns here there's a conditionality group and then labor market regime don't know what that is 
it kind of makes sense. Intensive work search for people who are out of work entirely. Light touch for people in work. So I'm presuming that means there's a bit of pressure on you to improve your income, but at least you have something coming in. <coughs> Excuse me. We have the no work requirements. So not expected to work because they have health issues, disabilities, mental health, long COVID, I don't know, or caring responsibilities, which prevents them from going into work. So you have young children and no child care. You have an elderly parent living with you who needs 24 hour care. It may be your partner has long term issues and needs 24 hour care, all that sort of thing. So we have the working no requirements section, which is individuals, our house, household earnings are over the level. So you're earning enough for the income floor. It doesn't mean it's enough to live on, but you're getting more than the income floor. But you're in, you're, your claim is left open and you just have to keep telling the DWP how things are going. This is particularly important if you are at risk of earnings loss. So it may be you are, your work is seasonal. It may be you are... Um, part-time but earning enough but the, but the business you work for is looking to cut hours or cut staff or that sort of thing so what it does is it keeps your claim open so that if you have a sudden change of circumstances you can just say I need help rather than having to start a claim from scratch and being weeks and weeks and weeks with no help um, so that's that's quite a good element of it that they allow your claim to remain open even though you don't need it at the moment but you are at high risk of suddenly needing it um, that seems like a good like a good system I like that element of it whether it works in practice I don't know planning for work so here we are expected to work in the future so your lead parent or your lead carer of a child who is aged one so presumably once they reach two you're supposed to shove your kid into childcare which I think is terrible. I, I would like it if more parents were staying at home looking after their children. I was very lucky. I came from a home where my mum stayed home and looked after us until we went to school. And then mum got a part-time job locally during the school hours. And that's the situation with my brother's household. So my brother goes to work full-time. Mum... Um, mum is available throughout the week to look after the children and then does her job two nights on a Friday night and at the weekend when um, when dad's around to look after the kids and then my parents kind of help as well because they live over the road. So they're kind of a, a one house, one person income household with a part timer on the top. Um, but it makes for a very stressful household. I won't go into the details of that. So preparing for work, expected to start work in the future, even if it's live with a limited capability. So it may be that your children are about to start school or nursery and you have maybe four, three or four or four or five hours in the day where um, you can go out and get a part-time job if you can find one that fits your hours. Claimants are expected to take reasonable steps to prepare for, for working, including work-focused interviews. So what they're expecting is that if your child then goes into, say, three days a week in childcare because they're preparing for school, you will be expected to try and find work that fits in with those hours. That is pretty much that entire document, and I just thought it was interesting just to add it here as a vlog. I know it's very long, but I think... I didn't realise how complicated Universal Credit was and they've created a system that theoretically works on paper but when you put real human beings into the system and a very toxic system which is the DWP from what I've heard it's a pretty awful place to work and the attitudes of a lot of the staff isn't the best <clears throat> for the claimants and of course you have quite a poor attitude from some claimants as well. You've got to push and pull push and pull in different directions as people have different experiences. It creates a very complicated system that doesn't work very well. But I thought that was interesting because I do get some very blanket comments that says, well all universal credit people are scroungers. And this probably comes from people who are in work who have never had to ask for help never needed an income top up, never been the one looking after small children, 
never had a long-term illness, um, never had their company go bust, were probably still working from home during the lockdowns because their company just says, ah, wait from home, because they were the lucky ones. Or they were in protected um, industries that were still going to work, like the NHS, like the supermarkets, like Royal Mail, places like that were still working because they were regarded as essential services. So, blanket comments that ev everyone's a scrounger, it doesn't fit because a lot of the people who are on universal credit as well are people who cannot work. You have people who are disabled uh, physically or mentally, have mental health challenges, people who are long-term sick for all sorts of reasons and people who are caring for relatives who through no fault of their own are on, either on long-term sick or disabled, you might have had a workplace accident, you might have, I mean, the range of things that will require you to need help from somebody full-time is just mind-boggling. So please don't class all universal credit claimants, benefits claimants as scroungers. You're only saying that if you have no concept of how difficult it is trying to live in a country where, I mean, we are lucky. There are countries where if you have no carers, you will starve to death and they will leave you to die. We don't have that here. We try to give people some semblance of a life, even if they are entirely dependent on other people because of things that are not their fault. So I thought that this would be an interesting breakdown. And as I say, this is biased because it is it does come from the DWP, but it gives you something to work with. So I hope you found that interesting. I've been sat here for a while, over an hour. It's quite chilly. <laughs> I'm going to have my cup of tea, which I haven't even started yet since I sat down. And I'm going to go and put another layer on and try and make some semblance of this. Um, I've done a screen record on this but I've also had my phone set up because the audio quality is better on the phone and because I hit record at the same time on both, it means that I can do a bit of um, chopping between this screen, that screen, but the volume, I can, I can blend the two together on my editing software and hopefully we'll get a slightly better quality um, vlog with using the screen. I hope it's been interesting. I've really learned a lot, actually. Um, you might want to skip through this, but if you're interested in how the system actually works rather than your own opinion of what you think everybody is like on Universal Credit, um, this could be educational for you, and I hope you find it interesting. So thank you for watching this. Do add your comments. Be constructive, don't be an idiot. Um, I do have moderation on my YouTube. If you post stupid comments, rude comments, vulgar comments, and yes, I do get them, you will go into my um, held box and your, your comment just won't get out there. So be constructive, don't just post an angry comment. Put things into interesting questions. Be constructive in, in what you ask or what you say. And let's start a conversation about this because I think this is really interesting. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting the channel. My little um, slapdash, very ordinary, no bells and whistles channel. That's the way I like it. That is the way it's going to stay. This is a, a transparent uh, authentic channel which is based on my life and the reason I've done this is because this is something that I found through just reading the internet last week and I just wanted to share it with you so I hope you've enjoyed that and I'm now going to go so speak to you again soon bye